So, yep, so I'll pass over to Dilshan. Thank you, Tamara, and thank you everyone for coming today. Um, yeah, like Tamara said, I'll be talking about um, a recent technique uh, developed by Rons Jones on constructing unitary representations of Thompson's group. Uh, so for the first part of the talk, I'll be talking a bit about Thompson's groups and uh, why people are interested about Thompson's groups. And I'll briefly outline the construction of um, building interior representations using Jones machinery. And in the second half of the talk, I'll talk a bit about the work that I've done with my supervisor, Anu Brodia, um, on looking at a particular type of uh, representations constructed using um, Jones, Jones machinery. Um, and before I just continue on, um, just one thing to note, um, when, I, when I say representations, I mean unitary representations. Uh, so to look at homomorphisms uh, from the groups to unitary operators on a open space. Um, and and, and uh, as I'm talking, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. So um, if you'd like, you can put them in the chat. I'll try to keep an eye for them as well. Okay, so to begin, uh, so Richard Thompson defined three uh, groups, F, T, and B, in 1965. Um, so um, the smallest group, group F, is defined to be the group of piecewise linear homeomorphisms of the unit interval with finally made discontinuities which are contained in the dyadic rationals. Uh, so dyadic rationals are fractions which are in the form of A over to the power N. Uh, so the easiest way to visualize elements of F is um, view them as graphs. Uh, for example, here we have element of F here, it's a piecewise linear graph. And we can see there's two points of discontinuities here at half and three quarters, which are dialect rationals. Um, and here on the right hand side, you can see another example of an element of F here as well. So here we have um, three. Um, sorry, uh, not, not, not discontinuities, I should say, sorry, uh, non differentiable points, I should say, <laughs> right? Uh, but here we have um, three non differentiable points as well. Um, at half, three quarters, and seven eighths. Um, and in fact, um, these two elements actually generate the entire group F. So in particular, F is a finitely generated, um, finitely generated by infinite group. So the larger groups, T and V, are defined in a similar way. Uh, so, so T is uh, can, similar to F, but we also allow cyclic permutations of these intervals. Uh, so it can be considered as homeomorphisms of the unit circle. And um, V is similar again, but now we allow any kind of permutation of these intervals and can be considered as homeomorphisms of the Cantor set. So um, while, the, while um, probably perhaps the easiest way of visualizing elements of Thompson groups uh, F is viewing them as um, functions on the unit interval. Um, usually a more convenient presentation is viewing them as a pair of trees, the same number of leaves, which are called tree diagrams. Uh, so the way this works is um, if you look at the domain, uh, firstly, you can see there's um, the two non differentiable points um, actually creates a partition of the unit interval, uh, which we can see here at the top here. Um, so you can see the break points at a half and three quarters. And similarly, if you look at the range, um, these two uh, non differentiable points um, also creates a partition in the unit interval. And that's what we have here at the bottom here. So the break points at a quarter and a half. So you can see here that, um, and in fact, you can actually easily see that every element of Thompson group F will give you two uh, partitions of the unit interval. So just a bit of terminology uh, we call a standard dyadic interval or SDI. Um, an interval consists, consisting of two dyadic rationals. Um, so in particular, you can see in these partitions here, um, all the intervals are gonna be um, static dyadic intervals. And a static standard dyadic partition is a partition consisting of SDIs. Um, so in particular, you can see both these partitions are gonna be STPs. Okay. Um, so, and not only that, so also from a standard dyadic partition, um, there's, uh, there's also, uh, you can also associate this with a binary tree. And the way it works is if you consider this binary tree that we have here, we can label each of the vertices of this binary tree with a standard dyadic interval. 
Uh, so we, we, the way it works is if we start with the top vertex or the root node, we label it with the uh, interval zero one. And then for the bottom left vertex, we assign it the first half of this interval, which is through the half. And then for the right vertex, we assign it the um, right, the top right, right half of this interval, which is one half to one. And we can label the rest of the vertices in a similar kind of fashion. Um, and one thing to note in particular is if you look at the leaves of the trees, um, these SDIs um, induces a standard dynamic partition of the unit interval. You know? uh, so, so, so this, this construction gives you, actually gives you a bijection between the set of um, SDPs and the set of binary trees. So if you combined uh, what we looked through in the last two slides, uh, what we have is we, we start with um, an element of F as I defined in the first slide. Um, we can firstly associate this with two different standard, standard dyadic uh, partitions. And then for each of these standard dyadic partitions, we can associate this with a binary tree. Um, and in, in particular, these two binary trees uh, will have the same number of leaves. So we call this a tree diagram. Um, and you can see uh, if the way this works for this tree, for example, the, um, the first vertex here in blue corresponds to the SDI through the half, which we have here. Um, second vertex is from half to three quarters. And the last vertex is three quarters of one. And similarly for the second binary tree here as well. Uh, so one thing you may notice is that we're drawing this tree diagram to look a bit like a fraction. Uh, and this is actually uh, done on purpose, and we'll see a bit later on as to the reason why we do this. Um, and another important thing to note as well is there isn't actually a unique tree diagram associated to each element of F. Uh, so the reason being is if you look at this partition, for example, um, we could create a new partition by um, inserting the midpoint in the first interval here. And correspondingly, we could add the midpoint here in the first uh, interval here as well. And this will give us two new standardic partitions. And this in turn will also give us two new binary trees. Uh, so these two tree diagrams here uh, will both correspond to the same element in F. And um, if you look at these two tree, two tree diagrams carefully, um, you notice really the only difference here is actually on the first two leaves here, which I've drawn in the blue edges here. Um, as, so this is also called a carrot, a tree with two leaves. So a carrot has been added to the first vertex um, to these two binary trees here. And more generally, uh, what you can do is, is given any vertex, um, you can, or well, given any corresponding vertex, uh, for example, these two red ones, I can add a carrot to these two vertices, and this will give you a new tree diagram that, um, that is associated to the same element in F. So what, what, so what you can do generally is then is consider the set of tree diagrams and define an equivalence relation uh, based on this process here. And you can show that this will be isomorphic to Thompson group F. So a bit more about Thompson group F and its properties. Uh, so Thompson groups are extensively studied because they are very fundamental groups uh, that appear naturally in various fields of mathematics. Uh, for example, not on, uh, besides in group theory, they appear in um, um, homotopy, uh, low dimensional topology, and measure theory. So there's some examples. Um, and not only that, um, their Thompson groups are one of the most interesting discrete groups because they share many remarkable properties that that's led to be led to be counterexamples to many conjectures. Uh, so, for example, um, the, the derived subgroup of F and TMV were the first examples of infinite but finally presented simple groups, and F was the first known example of a torsion-free infinite-dimensional group of type F infinity. Um, so by infinite dimensional group, we mean a group which contains an infinite rank um, free abelian subgroup. Um, some other properties of, about, of Thompson groups is that um, T is on a Kasserang group um, and V has a Hagrid property. Um, an interesting result as well is that F does not contain a copy of the free group of rank two. Um, and, it, and this was quite a significant result uh, because um, in 1979, uh, Ross Gagan uh, conjectured that F was a non-amenable group. Um, and so this meant, so with, so with, this, with this result, 
This meant that F was the first potential candidate to be a kind of example to the von Neumann problem. And to give a bit of uh, background behind this, uh, so back in 1929, when, 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 when von Neumann first uh, defined the concept of um, amenability for a group, he showed that if a group contains a subgroup isomorphic to the uh, free group of rank two, he showed that it must be non-amenable. Um, so later on, the question came, uh, came, question came about, um, is the converse of the statement true? That is, if a group is non-amenable, uh, must it not contain, uh, uh, must, must it contain a copy of a free group of rank two? And that's what's called, known as the von Neumann problem. So it was quite a difficult problem. Um, it, it seemed that it took quite a long time just to get a potential candidate to be a counter example. Um, and hence there was quite a lot of interest in trying to prove whether F was amenable or non-amenable. Um, so there's a lot of interest in, um, and research done on uh, Thompson Group in the past few decades as well, because a lot of its analytical properties have been challenging experts. Uh, and it's quite difficult to actually prove uh, many properties about Thompson Group. Uh, so in particular, in particular, as I just mentioned previously, uh, perhaps one of the most uh, famous, notable open questions regarding Thompson Group is whether it's amenable or non-amenable. Uh, so even though it was first conjectured it was non-amenable in 1979, this question still remains open today. And it's quite interesting because uh, there's actually no clear consensus on whether it's actually amenable or non-amenable. Uh, it's kind of like a 50-50 split on whether uh, which one it is. Uh, but not even that, even more ele elementary questions remain open, such as is a Cowling Hag group weakly amenable or is F a sect? <clears throat> uh, so, one of the reasons why um, it's so challenging to actually prove the analytical properties of Thompson group F is because we don't actually understand the representation theory of uh, F well enough. And this is important because uh, many analytical properties of groups have equivalent formulations in terms of its representation theory and in terms of matrix coefficients of representations. Um, and previously, there was only three um, known families of irre irreducible representations of Thompson group F. Um, hence, uh, we need to build more uh, families of these representations of F to help uh, develop a better intuition for the analytical properties um, of the group. So recently, um, Jones um, actually discovered a, a very general technique for constructing uh, families of representations of F. Um, and it was, it was quite a surprising discovery because um, initially Jones came across the discovery while working on conformal fields, which, are, which have very continuous structures opposed to the, the discrete nature of Thomson group F. Um, so the way this, this construction works is um, you start with an initial Hilbert space H and you specify an isometry between um, Hilbert spaces. And just from this data, uh, what you can do firstly is build a larger, a larger Hilbert space, a big H, and you can also define a unitary representation of Thompson group F uh, acting on this Hilbert space. Uh, so this is actually a very, very general technique um, and it's very powerful as well. So uh, there's, all, there's already been quite a lot of applications um, of this machinery. So for example, it's led to new proofs that the derived subgroup of F, T and V are not casted down groups. And it's led to new proofs that T and V have the Hagger property. So while these were already known results, uh, these, these results were quite difficult to prove and remained open for quite a long time. Hence the ease of the proof using Jones's construction uh, provides hope that we can prove even stronger properties um, using these techniques. Uh, some other applications of um, Jones's constructions is, is that it led to the first non-trivial examples of finally presented brief products with the Hagrid property. Um, and with some recent work with my supervisor, we use um, this construction to define a new family of irreducible representations of Thompson group. <clears throat> So I'll outline um, briefly how to construct a particular type of Jones representations um, known as Pythagorean representations. 
Um, and 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 this is and this is first um, and this was this was first written in a paper by Brote and Jones in 2019. Uh, so the way this construction works is again we start with initial Hubble space little h, and we define um, two bundle operators acting on this Hubble space, which satisfies um, this equation here, which we'll which we'll call the Pythagorean equation, Pythagorean identity. Sorry. Um, so if these two operators satisfy this identity, we call them a Pythagorean pair of operators. Um, so next step, what we can do is we can build um, a larger Hilbert space um, from these two operators. And the way we, we, the way we construct this large Hilbert space is we first take any binary tree, T, and we associate this with the direct sum of our initial Hilbert space to the number of, um, to the number of leaves this tree has. So for example, if we have this tree here, which has four leaves, we associate this with the direct sum of four copies of our Hilbert space. Um, and diagrammatically, we can view this as placing a copy of our Hilbert space under each of the leaves in the tree. And the way we view elements in this Hilbert space is we view them as um, our tree, uh, whose leaves have been decorated with elements in the Hilbert space. So for example, we have our four components where psi one, psi two, psi three, and psi four are elements in the, in the initial Hilbert space hatch. So we do this for every single binary tree. And then what we can do is we, is we take the disjoint union across all, all these binary trees, and then we place an equivalence relation on the set, and then we take the completion. And this forms our larger Hilbert space. And importantly, this Hilbert space will be always be infinite dimensional. Um, and so in the next slide, I'll talk a bit more about what this equivalence relation actually looks like. Um, but just one remark. Um, so more formally, what we're actually um, really doing here in this construction, sorry. So uh, what we're actually really doing here in, in this construction is um, from these two operators A and B, uh, we're defining a functor from the category of forests to the category of Hubble spaces where the morphisms are, in, uh, are asymmetries. And this functor is given uh, by here. So we're taking um, a natural number n to the direct sum of a Hubble space. And um, I should say specifically, this is actually a monoidal functor. So since it's monoidal, it's sufficient to define it on these carrots, which are trees with two leaves, because this generates the entire forest. And it's given by the direct sum of these um, two Pythagorean operators. Uh, and this is precisely why, why we require um, it to satisfy the Pythagorean identity, which is to ensure that this uh, map here is, a, is an isometry. So from this functor, uh, what you get is that the, the, the direct limit constructed from this functor is actually precisely the Hilbert space that we just defined here. Um, and also in more particular, uh, more generally, uh, we can construct, um, the way that Jones construction works is that if you have any functor from the category forest to um, the category of Hilbert spaces, you can um, define this um, joint representation in a similar kind of method. I had a question, Dilshan. Yeah. I, I'm not clear how this construction you have here before the remark depends on A and B. Is that yes, like, yes, that's a good that, question. So, yeah. Is that like all in the equivalence relation? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so actually, the only the, yeah, actually comes in the equivalence relation here, mm -hmm. uh, which I'll show you in the next slide. Okay. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah so, um, yeah, so the way to do this occurrence relation, I'll just show it in diagrams. It's a bit easier than just trying out the formula out. Uh, so just to consider example, uh, this is example of a equivalence class in our Hilbert space. So we have a carrot here and it has two leaves. So we have um, two components here, uh, psi one and psi two, which are elements in the small Hilbert space. Um, and, we're, and we're gonna look at what the representatives of this occurrence class looks like. So. This is one representative that we have easily. And what we can do is um, to get another representative is we can attach a carrot to the first leaf in this tree here. And this will give us a new tree. And we also added two new leaves here. So with these two new, two new leaves, we need to have two components for these two leaves. And the way we get these components is apply, by applying those Pythagorean pair of operators. 
where we apply a psi one and b psi one, which gives us our two new components. And we can actually repeat this process for any leaf in a tree. So for example, um, on this last leaf here, we can um, again add a carrot here and apply again the operators a and b to give us a new representative of the Zucrimus class. And we can keep doing this to get um, rep uh, representatives of this Zucrimus class. <clears throat> um, and as I mentioned at the start, we also have a unitary representation of F acting on this Hilbert space. Um, so again, I'll just show as a, show in, a, in a diagram of how this action works, as uh, rather than uh, giving out the formulas, a bit easier to understand by looking at the diagrams. So if you recall, um, this is an element of F here. We view it as a tree diagram. So it's two binary trees with the same number of leaves here. And this is an element in our Hilbert space. So I've drawn a bit differently here, uh, but you can see it's a, it's a tree with three, three, three leaves and we have three different components here. And now become a bit more apparent on why we kind of draw these like fractions. So, so when we multiply fractions, we want to make the numerator and the denominator the same and we can cancel them out. So we want to do a similar kind of construction here. So we have this, this tree here in the denominator and this tree here in the numerator. You can kind of think of it like this. And we want to make these two trees the same. And to do that, all we need to do is we, is we need to add a carrot to this leaf here. And to do that, well, we, we know we can actually do this because we have this equivalence relation here. So if we want to add a carrot to this second leaf here, um, all we need to do is also split the second component, psi two, into a psi two and b psi two. So this, is, this will belong to the same equivalence class as this element here. And now these two trees are the same, so we can kind of effectively cast them out. Um, and what we get is our element here. So where this tree just comes across, and then this is our new components. Um, another way you can kind of think of this action is what we're really doing here is we're just swapping out this tree here with this new tree here, and we don't touch the components. So you can show that this actually is well defined on the crimson classes, and is actually a unitary operator. Um, and hence, this gives us our unitary representation of F acting on this open space. And we call this the Pythagorean representation given by A and B. So just to give some examples of what kind of um, representations you can get from this construction, just to get an idea of what they look like. So perhaps the, the simplest case that you can consider is when your initial Hubert space is just a complex numbers and A and B are just constant numbers one and zero. So that's the simplest case you can have. Uh, but it's very surprising that even, even in the seemingly trivial case that you have, um, the Pythagorean representation that you get is actually non-trivial. So what we actually have is that it will be a direct sum of the trivial representation with the quasi-regular representation. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, where F half, um, this is the stabilizer subgroup of F, which fixes the point um, half. Uh, so that's one example. If we consider a slightly more complicated example, again, we consider the complex numbers as an initial Hubble space. And this time we let A and B be the number constant number one over the square root of two. And in this case, uh, what you get is that the Pythagorean representation is actually irreducible and is actually equal to, um, is actually equivalent to the Koopman representation of F acting on zero one. <clears throat> and what's actually, what's actually quite interesting is um, we can actually generalize this construction a bit more uh, by multiplying A and B by a scalar uh, a unit scale, I should say. So this will still satisfy the Pythagorean identity. So you can, you can kind of think of this as we're, where we're twisting A and B in the same direction here. And interestingly, um, from, this, uh, in, from, this, from this construction, we're actually able to recover um, a previously known family of irreducible rep representations um, constructed uh, by Gar and Craig in uh, 2012. Um, so it's actually really quite interesting um, quite interesting that even in this one, one dimensional case, um, it's actually quite a powerful construction that we're able to recover previously known families of representations. And not only that, we can actually further generalize this construction um, to get a more general family of representations. 
by multiplying A and B by two different scalars. Uh, so I guess kind of geometrically, we're twisting them in two different directions. So this was still satisfied by diagram identity um, as well. <clears throat> and um, now considering um, a two-dimensional case now, uh, so H is uh, the complex plane, and we let A and B be these two uh, matrices that we that identify with operators on the Hilbert space. Uh, and this you can show is satisfied by diagram identity here. And in this case, again, um, the Pythagorean representation will be the quasi-regular quasi representation. Uh, this time associated to the subgroup F103. And just wanted to note, uh, this, uh, this representation here is not equivalent to this representation uh, since um, half and one is a diagonal and one and three is not a diagonal, so they have different F4 or orbits. So yeah, so these are just some examples of what, what kind of Pythagorean representations you can get, some simple examples, just to get a concrete idea of what they look like. Um, and also just a, just a very quick sketch, sketch the proof um, for the fourth point. So um, this representation here being equivalent to the quasi-regular representation. So it's just to get an idea of how, does, what, how these representations uh, look like and, um, and how to work with them. So the way, we, the, way the proof goes is it follows from um, a result from the GNS construction, which states that the matrix coefficient of a cyclic vector uniquely determines the representation. Um, so here we're, we're going to consider an element uh, in our Hilbert space. So e, e here is the trivial tree, and E2 is the standard basis through one in our Hilbert space, which is the complex plane. And firstly, we, we're just going to consider what, what the representatives of this um, element looks like. So we have E2 here with like a trivial tree, which you can imagine as a, as, a, as a dot, for example. And then we can add a carrot to it to get a, another representative, representative of it. So when you apply the operator A onto the E2 here, we get E1. And when you apply B to E2, you get zero. That's going to be in the kernel. So that's what we have here. And then we can do the same process again. So if you add a carrot here, you will, you will just get zero, zero. So if you apply a carrot here on the first leaf, um, this time, again, when you apply A and B, you get zero and E2. And you can keep doing this process again. So, so on, you can apply the carrot again, uh, you get E1 and zero, and apply one more time, you get zero and E2. So the one thing you will notice here is that um, you, 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 we get this zigzag ray, which I've highlighted in blue here. And all the components which are off this ray, of the zigzag ray, is always will be zero. And on the zigzag, um, it will either be E1 and E2, it will be alternating E1 and E2 as you keep going down. And one thing to notice as well further is that this zigzag actually contains all the vertices which, whose SDI, its standard dynamic interval, contains the point 103. Uh, that's a, one thing to note as well. Okay. Um, so next thing um, you kind of need to know as well is that um, the stabilized subgroup, uh, so this is the subgroup that fixes the point 103. Um, so it's, its description in terms of tree diagrams is that it is a set of tree diagrams such that it has matching vertices on the same side of this zigzag here. So for example, um, I have a tree diagram here. So I've drawn a bit differently here. I've drawn it side by side, the two trees, instead of being top and bottom. Uh, but you can see this will be an example of an element in the subgroup here. Reason being is because um, this third leaf here and its corresponding third leaf here both lie on this, this diagonal zigzag and uh, spe specifically lies on the right hand side of the zigzag here. So this will be an element in the stabilized subgroup. And if we were to look at the matrix coefficient of uh, associated to this element G, so the matrix coefficient is computed by um, taking this inner product. Uh, what you can see uh, happens is that this will be equal to one. Uh, reason being is uh, what you get here is when you, on the right-hand side, uh, what you get is you get a tree, which looks like this with, with E2. And on the left-hand side, you also get a similar looking tree as well, which has E2, and then the inner product will give you one. And, and it's not too difficult to see if you, if you, if you draw out these diagrams, um, if you have any element G in this um, subgroup, 
um, the, this matrix coefficient will always equal one. And if G is not in the subgroup, so let's say it had a vertex, one was on the diagonal and another one was off this diagonal, um, in that case, the matrix coefficient will be equal to zero. Um, and, that's, and really the reasoning behind all of this is, is because of this fact here that um, this, these components will always be um, non-zero on this diagonal and zero everywhere else. So that's, so that's a very, very um, brief outline of the proof. And, and also another thing that you would need to show as well is that you need to show that this effect is cyclic, uh, but I won't go through that here. <clears throat> Yeah, and also, um, and importantly, this also turns out to be the matrix coefficient for the quasi-regular representation uh, associated to the subgroup F103. Okay, so, um, so, so, so some, of, some of the work that I've done uh, with my supervisor, Arno Brotia, is look at, looking at some of the general properties of these pi-diagonal representations. And surprisingly, you can actually say quite a lot about these pi-diagonal representations. Um, and they have quite nice properties. Uh, so some uh, examples, uh, so example, uh, one property is that uh, this, these representations will almost always contain almost invariant vectors. Um, and actually another important thing I should mention as well, which I forgot to mention earlier, is that these representations actually extend to a representation on the larger Thompson groups T and V as well. And importantly, um, they actually these uh, these extensions to the larger groups actually act on the same Hilbert space as well, which is which is quite nice. Um, another another property that we have is that um, the pythagorean all the all the pythagorean representations for any pythagorean pair will always give you an amenable representation. So this is quite an interesting thing to look at because, um, as I mentioned earlier at the start. Quite interesting, quite a question of particular interest is whether f is amenable or non amenable. Um, and then, one theory, you have, one theorem that you have is for discrete groups, um, a group is amenable if and only if um, all its representations are amenable. So, it is, it is interesting to see if these representations are amenable or not, because uh, if you do have a non amenable re uh, representation, that will mean that the group is non amenable. But in this case, you always have amenable representations for these pentagonal representations. Um, and as well, uh, in a case when your initial Hubert space, the one that you start at the very start with this construction, when this is finite dimensional, we actually have this very nice uh, decomposition of the pythagorean representation. Uh, so you can always decompose it into this form here, where these psi i's, these are one dimensional representations. Um, and, and, and then you have a direct sum of these monomial representations. So a monomial representation is the induction of a one-dimensional representation. And a pony is of a very specific form. So always be the induction of a, a stabilizer subgroup. Uh, so, the, the, so a subgroup that fix, fixes the point xj. And further, this xj will always be a rational number. Um, and, and then you also have a direct sum with some another pythagorean representation. And importantly, this pythagorean representation has very nice properties. So firstly, this pythagorean representation is weakly mixing. So weakly mixing means that it does not contain any finite dimensional sub-representations. And secondly, um, this representation does not contain the induction of any finite dimensional rep representation of any subgroup of F. Um, so this is quite a nice property. Uh, in particular, the second property um, as far as, as we are aware, there's no representation of F, pre there's no previously known representation of F, which has this property. Uh, so it really is quite a nice property uh, to have. Uh, and just a bit more details on this decomposition. So these one-dimensional uh, these one-dimensional representations, um, these only occur if A or B has a unit eigenvalue. So for example, if you go back to these examples here, um, in this first scenario here, um, A has a unit eigenvalue, one, of course. So you can see here, we actually has this, we actually has this uh, one dimensional representation here in this decomposition. Um, and then these monomial representations, so these actually only occur if there exists some element um, psi in your small Hilbert space, which is contained in array. 
in some sense. So what I mean by that is if you look at this um, our previous example here, um, you can kind of think of this element E2 being contained um, in this zigzag ray here because anywhere off the ray is going to be zero and on the zigzag is always going to have its norm um, conserved. So we can think of it this element being, cons um, being contained in this ray and you can think more generally uh, for, any, for any ray, you can kind of think of this concept of elements being contained in this ray. And what you get is that if, you, if, if, if such a vector and ray exists, then this will actually give you this monomial representation. And we do see that's actually the case in this example here. Um, we do have a monomial representation. This is the induction of the trivial representation here. <clears throat> So from, from this, from this um, decomposition, we actually get two very nice correlates. So uh, when H is finite dimensional, um, we get that this, uh, the Pythagorean representation will be weakly mixing. So it won't contain finite dimensional sub-representations sub -represent, sub if and only if A and B have no you know, eigenvalues. Uh, so one thing I should mention is these monomial representations are always ir irreducible and infinite dimensional. And the second uh, corollary that we have is that the Pythagorean representation will not contain the induction of any finite dimensional rep representation of any subgroup of F, um, if and only if um, the limit of the words go to zero. Uh, so what I mean by this, sorry, let me just um, Yeah, so what I mean by um, this notation here is um, we say the words um, go to zero if for every asylum greater than zero, um, the norm um, of these words, so by, by words, I mean um, words in A and B, I mean, so you can consider them, consider, consider them as the operators um, on this, acting on the small Hilbert space H. So for every asylum greater than zero, um, there's only finite number of words in A and B, such as, such as its norm is greater than, the greater than, greater than asylum. Um, so this is actually just equivalent to saying that there's no um, vector which is contained in an array in some sense, in which I just described earlier. Okay. Um, and also uh, a very nice uh, kind of connection that you have with, the, with these Pythagorean representations is that there's actually a very close uh, relationship with the Kunz algebra. So the Kunz algebra, so here I'm talking about um, O2 here. This is the universal C star algebra generated by two asymmetries, uh, which satisfies this identity here. So it's known that from any representation of a Kunz algebra, you can obtain a representation of F, of, of F, T, and V, in fact. Uh, but there's no general method known to get a representation of a Kunz algebra from the from a Thomson group. Uh, but uh, for Pythagorean representation in, in particular, um, this, this, this reverse process is actually possible. This, uh, uh, possible. So this, this, this was first discovered um, in the original paper by Brote and Jones, uh, where for every Pythagorean representation, we can associate this with a representation of the Kunz algebra. Uh, and even more importantly, is that from this induced representation, we can actually recover back the original representation of the Thomson group F and V actually more generally. So, and the way this works is what we can do is we can define an injection from the largest Thompson group V into the Kunz algebra, such that the restriction of this induced representation on the image of this, of this injection is gonna be um, equivalent to the original uh, Pythagorean representation. Uh, so this is, this is a very nice relationship that we have with Kunz algebra. Um, and just a quick sketch of the proof for the first part of the statement here. So to define a representation of Kunz algebra, all you, all you need to do is define two asymmetries on acting on the Uber space. Um, so that's all you need, really need to do. So these two asymmetries, um, I'll just kind of show them as a diagram on how they act. So if you consider example of element in, this, in the larger Uber space, so you have a carrot here and two components. So the first operator S1 will act by, um, what you can think of it is what you're doing is you're picking up this element here and you're dropping it on the first vertex on the left. So we're dropping it on here on the first, first vertex. And then we make the other component zero. 
So that's what we're doing. That's, that's what this map does. So more generally, if you have like any kind of element here with any kind of tree, you're just, you're just picking it up and dropping it on the first vertex. And you can show that this is an anisometry here. And the map S2 is defined in a similar fashion, uh, but now we're picking it up and we're dropping it on the vertex on the right-hand side. Yeah. So you can show that these actually are well-defined maps and they're well-defined on the equivalence classes of the elements in this Hubble space here. And you can also show that they satisfy this identity here as well. So th what, this, what this means is that you can define a representation of the Kunz algebra by setting um, lowercase si to capital Si here. And this will give us the representation. <clears throat> Okay, um, so um, so also, also so using these diagonal representations, uh, we also uh, looked at a uh, we also constructed a, a, new, a specific class of diagonal representations, uh, which are continuous in some sense. So the way this works is we took our initial Hubble space to be the complex plane, and then we considered um, a matrix um, on C two. Uh, such that the columns are unit vectors. So you set aside this equation here. And then we set um, our operator A to be, uh, you take the first column, you set the second column to be zeros, and you set, and you set um, the operator B, uh, the first column to be zero, and then you take the second column from U. And you can show that this, satisfy, this satisfies the Pythagorean identity. <clears throat> uh, and, this, uh, and, and we said that this, this um, in some sense, uh, forms a continuous class of representations. Um, so, where, so where A is the set of all matrices which satisfies this condition here. So it's continuous in some sense because um, this set A is path connected. So given any two matrices which satisfies this condition here, you can define an, a continuous path between these two matrices. And this in turn, in some sense, gives you a continuous deformation between the two associated by diagonal representations. Um, and more formally, um, if you consider the fold topology on, um, on the representations of F, you can show that um, this map here uh, from this matrix to these pedagonal representations is actually continuous in this topology. And just a remark, um, more generally, uh, we can actually generalize this construction to high dimensions uh, by you, by taking U to be any unitary operator on the initial smaller Hubble space, and we take P to be any projection on this Hubble space, and then we can set A to be um, the composition of um, these two maps here, and B to be uh, these two compositions here. Um, so in the case here, um, uh, P, our projection at P here is just a projection onto um, the standard basis E1 in this case here. And, and this construction is actually a bit more general than this one in the sense that um, here we don't necessarily, necessarily need a unitary matrix, we just need a matrix which satisfies this condition here. <clears throat> so just to give some examples of what these representations look like, uh, just to give some kind of ed edge examples. So uh, one case, the simplest case perhaps is when the matrix is diagonal. And in this case, we get this decomposition into two one-dimensional representations and two monomial representations here. <clears throat> and in particular, you can see why these occur, these one-dimensional representations occur, because in this case, um, A and B will have eigenvalues of alpha and beta, which are unit values, which, uh, which uh, agrees with, what, with that decomposition uh, I showed earlier in the previous slides. Uh, if you consider the kind of the opposite case now when you have an anti-diagonal matrix, um, in this case, uh, we get that the pedagonal representation is actually um, the is actually a monomial representation associated to the stabilizer subgroup of one on three. Uh, and this is actually very similar to the example I showed earlier, where we had, um, okay, let's go back a bit. It's quite similar to this sample here. Uh, but it's a bit more general now where we have, instead of having one and one, we have alpha and beta here. So instead of having the induction of a trivial representation, we have a induction of this one dimensional representation instead. So some kind of twist we're applying to it now. And importantly, this one dimensional representation here <clears throat> only depends on the product 
of these two entries here, interestingly. So the individual, the individual entries actually don't matter too much up to criminal classes. It's only really the product of the anti-diagonal entries that matters. And one last example, which is interesting, is when the two columns are actually the same vector. And it actually turns out in this case, uh, the pi-diagonal representation will be equivalent um, to the pi-diagonal representation arising from the one-dimensional case, where alpha and beta are constants, uh, constant numbers. So in particular, this, this family of representations actually completely covers the one-dimensional case. And in particular, if you set alpha and beta to be um, um, some unit scalar times by one of the square root of two, this recovers the family of representations constructed by Gantt correct, as I mentioned earlier. So this family of representations has very nice properties, and you can actually say quite a lot about them. Uh, so firstly, if you define Q to be the maximum um, moduli of the diagonal entries, uh, we can... Uh, we have the following uh, statements. So firstly, we have that these representations are irreducible if and only if Q is less than one. Um, and in particular, if Q is equal to one, then it will be a direct sum of one dimensional and monomial representations. So if you look at the first example here, um, Q will be equal to one here because these will be scalar, unit scalars. And we can see here that it is indeed um, a decomposition of one dimensional and monomial representations. And uh, important thing to note, these minimal representations are always irreducible. <clears throat> um, in the case when Q is between zero and one, then we get that um, the, the pi-diagonal representation will not be the induction of, of any, finite, any finite dimensional representation of any subgroup of F. Um, in the case when Q is equal to zero, so this is equivalent to um, the matrix being an uh, anti-diagonal matrix, in this case, we get the pi-diagonal representation is a monomial representation. So that's this example here too. Um, here, Q will be equal to zero, it's an anti-diagonal matrix, and we get that it is a monomial representation. Um, and lastly, uh, we can actually show, probably most, most importantly, we can actually show that these representations are actually not equivalent, so they're actually different to each other um, in almost uh, all, in all cases, except for um, some, some small conditions. Um, so for example, uh, we can see in this case, in case number two, if we had another diagonal matrix where um, the diagonal entries uh, also equal alpha beta, equal the same product, then these two pi-diagonal representations would be isomorphic to each other, or equivalent to each other, I should say. And uh, one thing to note in particular as well is that um, this third case, in this particular case, when alpha and beta is equal to the scalar times one over the square root of two, in this case, Q will be equal to one over the square root of two, uh, and in this case, we immediately get that these representations will be irreducible and uh, will not contain this induction, will not contain any induction of finite dimensional representations. And this actually quite, uh, this is, and this really shows how, um, how powerful Jones' construction is because um, in these original representations considered by Gein correct, um, he showed that it doesn't contain any monomial representations. Uh, so by using using Jones's techniques, we can actually um, say even further and say um, say, say that H doesn't contain um, any induction of any subgroup of F. Uh, and just to give some examples of previously known uh, uh, previously known irreducible families of representations, um, so there's representations constructed uh, by Irujo and Pinto, which arise from the Kuntz algebra. Uh, so for these family representations, um, so original printer proved that these were irreducible for um, Thompson group V, uh, but they were unable to prove it for, it, it's unknown whether it's irreducible for F and T. We also have um, family representations, uh, which are analogous to the principal series of representations, which are constructed by Gantt Krepp, which I just mentioned earlier in the previous slide. And we also have another family of irreducible, irreducible rep representations, uh, constructed by Jones using um, Jones this, this machinery here, uh, but these class representations are not pi-diagonal representations. Um, they're a bit different. They they arise from these trivalent tensor categories instead. Um, so it's, so they, they, there's still, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's this, this, this construction is very flexible, and there's still a lot of uh, different directions that can be uh, kind of studied and looked further at. Uh, so perhaps. Uh, 
the first kind of question uh, that, 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 that remains is um, in this construction here, in this uh, construction here, is there any other two dimensional cases that uh, are not covered by this, by this construction here? And what do they look like? Um, as well, we can consider generalizations of this previous construction by looking at higher dimensions. Um, and we could also look at representations of Thompson like groups as well, not necessarily FTMV, um, but other groups which have, also have a similar kind of tree structure. We could also look at the structure of taking um, different tensor products of these Pythagorean representations and see what kind of properties they have. And a particularly interesting question as well is asking um, necessarily is every sub representation of a Pythagorean representation either a random representation or a Pythagorean representation? Um, so this would be quite a nice thing um, to have if it, if it was true, um, but I guess it would be quite a difficult result to prove. The, um, yeah, so that concludes uh, the, what I had to say today. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, feel free, feel free to ask after you take any questions. I had one, oh, I had a few questions still, Sean. Yeah. Do, do you know what the Murray von Neumann type of these representations are? Are you familiar with that? So um, could, could, could you say the first part again? What was the... Are, are you familiar with von Neumann algebras? Um, yes, I, I, mean, I haven't studied the von Neumann algebras generated by these representations, uh, but I'm familiar with what they are. Yeah, I was, I was just asking, do you know what the type of these representations ah, right. are? Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I haven't studied, I haven't studied, I haven't, I haven't looked into it, what they look like uh -huh. uh, at the moment. But yeah, I guess it would be interesting to look at what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and earlier in your talk, you said that, I think it was Thompson's group F, that it's an open question as to whether this group's exact. Yeah. What 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 do you mean by exact here? Yeah. Uh, so um, I guess one definition for exactness in terms of representation theory is if it contains um, if it contains an amenable action on a compact space. So in particular, if a group is amenable, then it will be exact. So what do you mean by an amenable action? So uh, amenable action is so. Um, for, for a discrete group to be amenable, it, it means to have an um, a left invariant, sorry, uh, it, it means to have a left invariant probability measure on the yeah. group. So for an action to be amenable, similar kind of concept, it's when, uh, if it's acting on the space, on the, on the Hubble space H, it means there's a uh, probability measure on this Hubble space H, which is invariant by the action. Mm -hmm. Is this equivalent to a property of the group C star algebra? Um, for the action to be amenable? Uh, for the group to be exact. Oh, for the group to be exact. Um, not sure. I mean, I know like for, I, know, I, know, I think for F, F specifically, um, F being amenable is, specific, is equivalent to the C star algebra generated by the quasi regular representation to be simple. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure about it, 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 for, for exactness. I haven't seen anything like that. Because there's a there's there's a notion of exactness for C star algebras. I was wondering if that's ah uh, right right related, but yeah yeah perhaps it is. I'm I'm not too sure. Yeah. I, I'm only I'm only, I'm only familiar with the the one about the representation theory uh -huh. side of it. Yeah, that's fine. All right, thank you. Yeah, nice. <clears throat> I might also ask one more question. Yeah. What 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 did you mean by amenable representation here? Uh, amenable representation. Yeah. Yeah. So amenable amenable representation is when uh, if it's acting on. Um, Hubble space H, yep. there's a probability measure 
on the open space, which is yeah. invariant by the action. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. If there's no further questions, I'll ask us to thank Dilshan again for giving a great talk and I will stop the recording. <laughs>